Hey everyone, Eric here. Just before we get to today's show, I want to let you know that we're offering our podcast listeners a special 20% lifetime discount to the China Africa Daily Brief. Now that's the newsletter that Cobus and I produce every day that provides the most comprehensive digest of everything China's doing on the continent and now increasingly throughout the global south. In addition to the newsletter, you'll also get full archive access to the website and the China Africa Experts Network as well. To get that discount, just go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe and use the promo code podcast at checkout. Once again, that's ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Witts University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa-China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, over the past week, there have been dueling press conferences in Washington and Beijing from the respective Secretary of State and the Foreign Minister. And today we're going to be talking about how the U.S.-China relationship is going to impact Africa. So this past weekend, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, spoke on the sidelines of the National People's Congress. Now that is in the two sessions. Some of you may have been heard that about what's been going on. That's China's basically rubber stamp parliament annual gathering that they get together and they lay out what's going to happen in the next five years. And it's really a a big event. And Wang Yi kind of got together on Sunday with the international press and the Chinese press. And he laid out a number of the different priorities. And right at the top, I mean, this was a question posed by a CCTV journalist. It was the first question out of the gate. And he was asked to rate and review what happened in 2020. And the number one thing that he said was, of course, the relationship with the United States. Now, he didn't, in typical Chinese fashion, actually reference the United States. But you'll hear what he said through an interpreter here. It's unmistakable who he was talking about. Over the last year, the most resolute is our determination to defend national interests. We stood firm against hegemony, high-handedness, and bullying, and rejected outright interference in China's domestic affairs. China's sovereignty is not to be infringed upon, and the dignity of the Chinese nation is not to be trifled with. The legitimate rights of the Chinese people shall be upheld. That's a very strong tone, Kobe, is coming from Wang Yi, clearly referencing the United States and the attacks that Beijing perceives that it's been under on issues, everything from Xinjiang to Hong Kong to the South China Sea, Taiwan, COVID, you name it. It's been a very difficult year in U.S.-China relations. Now, the week before that, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, he laid out Washington's top foreign policy priorities, and he put the competition with China at the top of the list. We will manage the biggest geopolitical test of the 21st century, our relationship with China. Several countries present us with serious challenges, including Russia, Iran, North Korea. And there are serious crises we have to deal with, including in Yemen, Ethiopia, and Burma. But the challenge posed by China is different. China is the only country with the economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to seriously challenge the stable and open international system. All the rules, values and relationships that make the world work the way we want it to, because it ultimately serves the interests and reflects the values of the American people. Now, Kobus, we've talked about this on a number of occasions on the podcast and on our website and in our daily newsletter about how African governments, and not just in Africa, but also here in Southeast Asia and other parts of the world, really are adamant about the fact that they don't want to be a part of another Cold War, particularly because in Africa, they remember the last time there was a Cold War, it did not end well for them, and they've made it very clear that they don't want any part of this. However, Kobus, it looks increasingly likely, based on the rhetoric that we heard from just the past week, that African countries are going to need to have a strategy on how to deal with this, 
simply because the tensions do seem to be escalating. Yes, definitely. I mean, you know, if, if there is a, a new Cold War, which, you know, it's, it's like I, I'm always a bit worried about kind of throwing around that term. But if there is a new Cold War, it's going to look a lot different from the old Cold War. You know, the, the old Cold War happened in a moment of decolonization, with a lot, you know, in Africa, particularly with lots of little armies that was that were relatively e- easy and cheap to fund by, by external actors like the Soviet Union. In the, the you know, the, the new conflict would be a lot more about on a lot more global scale but then also a lot more about issues like standards um, all kinds of technological standards um, and you know so, so and the the way that these countries are gonna are gonna choose sides will also be very different so you know I think it's really important for Africa to 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 work out a strategy at least about where they want to be facing if, if this happens well let's get a perspective on America's global power competition with China and a view from from the trenches, we're really honored to have on the show for the first time uh, Ambassador Tibor Naj, who up until this year was the Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. For those of you not familiar with the State Department hierarchy, that makes Ambassador Naj the top, or when he was in the role, the top diplomat for Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, just before we get to Ambassador Naj, let me just tell you a little bit about him. He's a, has a distinguished 30-year career in the U.S. Foreign Service where he served as both ambassador in Guinea and Ethiopia. After retiring from the State Department the first time, he became the vice provost of international affairs at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas, and then rejoined the diplomatic corps in 2018 when he became the assistant secretary, a position that he held right up until the end of the Trump administration, which, by the way, it's customary that officials at that rank step down so a new president can appoint his or her own people. Ambassador Naj, a very good morning to you from Washington, D.C. Thanks very much, uh, Eric. Uh, Good afternoon to you in uh, South Africa and Cobus. Uh, Good evening to you uh, there on the other side of the world. Thanks so much for having me. It's wonderful to have you, especially because a lot of the, you know, a lot of the memories that you've had from your time in office are fresh, and we're really looking forward to getting some of your first-person perspectives. We'd like to get your take, though, on a column that you published just recently in in your local newspaper in Lubbock, Texas, Lubbock Avalanche Journal. And you wrote, again, America's global power competition with China from the the trenches. Let me read just a, a line from this. You said, over the last several years, as Assistant Secretary of State for Africa, I was able to see firsthand exactly how China is pursuing global dominance as that continent is where China is using its most unrestrained and aggressive tactics. You've traveled up and down the continent, spoken to, I assume, every leader. You've spoken to dozens, if not hundreds, of civil society groups. Tell us more about why you think China is such a threat and how it's playing out in Africa. Uh, Well, you know, and I also want to incorporate something that uh, Kobus said, that this version of global power competition is going to be totally different than uh, what it was with the Soviet Union, because I, much of my diplomatic career was spent during that particular era. And, uh, and I recall that that was extremely binary uh, because African governments were basically given a choice when they became independent, whether to go with the Soviets or, or whether to go with the, uh, as I call it, the good guys. Uh, and they couldn't really play both sides. Uh, this time is going to be much, much different uh, and in different uh, areas. At that time, uh, the United States, especially our diplomatic efforts, were well-funded, well-equipped, and very well-planned to confront the Soviet Union uh, literally eyeball to eyeball, program for program, across the continent. This time, uh, what really shocked me as I got back into the State Department was how unprepared we were on the ground and most especially in Africa. One of the things I looked at specifically was uh, in each of the countries, how many people did the Chinese embassy have dealing specifically, for example, with trade issues, with investments? And then I compared that to what we had. And, you know, in Africa, we have some of our smallest embassies. And we had some places where we may have one officer 
uh, who does both the political and the economic, which includes the trade promotion. And then when the consular officer happens to be on leave, they also do visas in the morning. So <clears throat> the United States effort on the ground, uh, most especially in Africa, really is grossly under-resourced to be able to do, uh, you know, this kind of a, of a equitable competition with the Chinese, because it, it, it kind of as Koba said, we no longer are in a position to, to strong arm uh, the, you know, the African uh, states to say, well, you know, you either go with us or you go with the Soviet Union. And, you know, if you go with them, then, then this is what's going to happen to you. And oh, by the way, we may fund a, uh, you know, a rebellion to, to overthrow you. You know, that, that has out of the way now. So it, it, it has to be a kind of a genuine competition, giving people a choice, which means an awful lot of soft power on the cultural side, educational side, but then also this very critically important trade relationship. You mentioned and you also wrote in your article that, that, that you see Africa as, particularly, as a particularly important kind of field for, for this conflict to play out. When you, when you spoke with your African counterparts, which kind of things did you warn them about in relation to having closer relationships with China? Well, you know, it, it, it's interesting because I really didn't have to warn anybody about anything. Um, the, the, the talking points that the Trump administration promoted were not always the talking points that I used. Because, uh, and, I, and I'm sure that you guys have seen this in some of my remarks, I, I, I said almost everywhere that, you know, from my point of view, uh, I know the Chinese relationship in Africa. I know how far it goes back, uh, which a, a lot of people don't realize that it goes back decades and decades and decades. And, and the point I made was that, yes, for many years now, Africans were looking for outside investment and there was a knock on the door and they opened the door. The only person standing there were, were the Chinese. Uh, my job was to try to get, uh, you know, Americans so that the next time there's a knock on the door, there's also, uh, you know, people from the United States standing there. So uh, from the African point of view, I mean, it, it's an advantageous position because now they have uh, many more choices than they did decades ago. I mean, one of my last conversations with Prime Minister Mellis uh, in Ethiopia, this was uh, at, long after I retired, and, and he said, uh, you know, we became quite good friends. And, and he said, Tibor, you know, uh, even back in 2000, uh, our choices were limited, but now, uh, you know, we have, we have many new friends we can pick from, and that's not just the Chinese. Uh, but it's also other entrants like the, you know, the Turks, the, the Indians, uh, the Gulf states. So Africans have many more options. And uh, the United States has to be very serious in how we treat this because we certainly cannot take those markets uh, for granted anymore. We've, we've seen the reversal, I think, in 2008 or 2009 when the Chinese displaced us. So now it really is uh, key and, and I hope that this administration does this to dedicate much, much greater resources to this serious global power competition, and again, especially in Africa. This is a problem that seems like it's been building up, not just for one administration or two administrations, but really going back decades. Uh, really, the last major initiative to come out of Washington for Africa was PEPFAR, and the George W. Bush administration. We're talking major initiative on a big scale. Yeah. And that was 20 yeah. years ago, right? Yeah, exactly. But, you know, I, I, here's another thing. The, the whole, um, you know, the, the, the Prosper Africa initiative, if, if it is done right, and, and, and I'm underlying that, if it is done right, it could be a major initiative along the lines of AGOA, uh, PEPFAR, uh, Young African Leaders Initiative that Obama did, because it is it is what the United States has needed uh, for 20, 30 years. And those of us who were on the ground were asking exactly for that type of a thing. And, you know, it was embarrassing uh, for me because uh, for decades we pounded the desks of African ministers of trade and investment and, you know, beseeched them to establish one-stop shops 
for investments in their countries. And the dirty little secret was that the United States of America had never had a one-stop shop uh, for investments in Africa. And American companies, you know, we have the global companies that can invest anywhere from, you know, Antarctica to, to Zimbabwe, no problems at all. But it's, you know, from my perspective, it's the medium size and the, and the smaller enterprises that really could benefit from, from African investments. But they were just, uh, you know, unprepared, uh, unsophisticated, and frankly scared to invest in places like that. But the United States government was really doing nothing uh, to promote that type of investment. So everything we hear is about the potential. And you talk about this in your column that the United States has uh, what you call a secret weapon in the form of scholarships and, and the Young African Leadership Initiative. And you even wrote that you said that, you know, African students would much rather come to the United States than get a dose of Mao and Xi Jinping thought in China. However, the pieces of the puzzle are all on the table in Washington. There is an Exim Bank, there's a Development Finance Corporation, there's the Young African Leadership Initiative, there is Prosper Africa. There's, you know, so many different pieces, but everybody talks about, as you just said, if China today is bringing in 82,000 students a year pre-COVID, China today is doing the trade, Chinese companies are on the ground. So if you're sitting in Africa and you're listening to the American offer of, well, I got to try and mobilize everybody back home to get interested. And then anybody who sees what the Chinese are bringing in says, well, the Chinese have the people, the money, the investment, they're giving scholarships, they're doing trade. Four times the amount of trade is what the Americans are doing. What did you say to that? How do you respond to that difficult situation that you were in to have those kind of conversations? Yeah, there, there's no easy answer, obviously. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing, you know, it, as I said in the column, I, I'm, I've always been an Afro-optimist. From the time I sat down in Zambia in 1978, I've always been an Afro-optimist. Finally, I think that is coming to fruition with what I call the youth tsunami. You know, I, I made that a central uh, kind of feature of, of the policy I tried to pursue as Assistant Secretary because the fact is uh, that it may be entering an African century given the incredible population growth that Africa's undergoing. And I'm betting on the youth because the youth in Africa are just like youth everywhere else. And, and as I said in my column, they do not want a big dose of uh, Xi Jinping thought because they have seen this in their own countries where their own leaders are often, you know, twice or often three times their age. You know, they want those old folks off the, off the scene they want to do away with these corrupted elections like we just saw in, in Uganda. Uh, they want to participate fully in their country's uh, political lives. Uh, they want an even shot at entrepreneurship, at investment. They want uh, to be able to have free reign on the Internet so they can you know, sell their products uh, internationally on the Internet. Uh, they don't want uh, censorship. They don't want authoritarianism. They don't want the, the police coming around and smashing their heads in. And unfortunately, a lot of that would come with China. Well, you know, on, on that point, I was I, I was wondering what kind of reaction you got when when you raised that issue because you know you you in, in your in your column you you write that um, that China doesn't you know that, that China prefers to do business with with non um, non democratic countries. Let me actually rather read what you said um, that China is an aggressive imperialist power um, planning world domination through calculated long term strategy to displace the global system carefully. Uh, constructed by the United States past World War II and replace it with its own model. And then it, that China-centric world model would, would favor nations with, without fundamental freedoms um, and without uh, competitive elections and so forth. But, you know, what, what we've seen so far, and, and this, you know, this, we, we've heard that many times in many, many fields of people from, from many different scholars on China-Africa issues, is that in a lot of ways, China doesn't really care what the system is in, in, in other countries. So, for example, like, you know, we, we, we did a, an interview a while ago with a, with an expert in, in Chinese internet provision, um, and we asked them um, clearly, like, does China favor, you know, a, a China-style kind of authoritarian internet system? Are they trying actively trying to sell that to, to African leaders? 
and and he he was saying according to his research they essentially just provide what the africans want if they if the africans want an open democratic system that's what they build if they want a, a centralized you know interventionist system that's what they build too they they don't care so you know so how, how much traction does that does that kind of line have in africa i you know from my perspective again having watched china for a long time i i, I think you're right that for a large portion of China's relationship with Africa, it, it was it was like that. It was uh, you know they will be happy to do business with anybody, uh, although they prefer the authoritarian uh, you know close controlled societies because they you know obviously were much more comfortable dealing with that. I I, I had a good laugh over China and the the DRC elections a couple of years ago when, when they assured the Chinese ambassador, they assured everybody that uh, Kabila's designated successor was going to win by the large margins that uh, the Kabila folks were putting out. And of course, it was obvious to everybody else that it was not going to happen like that. But if, if, if you look at the political evolution within China, I, I, I fear uh, that the Xi you know, personality cult is growing, that the authoritarianism is getting more severe. And I, it's just a feeling I have, again, having dealt with the Soviets, having grown up as a little kid in a communist regime and been a proud member of the, uh, you know, the, the Red uh, Neckerchief Society, the Young Pioneers. I, I just fear that China is is going to get much, much stricter in their foreign policy will be reflecting this growing uh, internal authoritarianism uh, control. I mean, you know, we were talking earlier about the chutzpah comment, but I was also laughing that, uh, you know, the Chinese diplomats uh, around Africa especially were using all of these social media to promote their points of view that you could not get on in China. Uh, Hypocrisy has always bothered me. And I, I fear that we're just getting greater and greater doses of hypocrisy now from the Chinese. Well, it's interesting because you have such a fascinating background of someone who grew up in a communist system. You were a cold warrior yourself, and now you're looking at a new great power rivalry. And so I'd like to get your take on this. You know, I was an intern in the State Department in 1992, back when wow. I was a student uh, in, <laughs> in, in, in Shanghai and in Washington, D.C., and, and the State Department back then and he, was optimized and built to, to battle the Soviets. Yep. The entire U.S. government system was built in the post-war era to confront the Soviet Union. In the time that I was in the State Department in 1992, all the way to the present, I haven't seen a radical restructuring of the organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think you're 100% right. China today is vastly more powerful it is vastly more authoritarian. This is about Xi Jinping, uh, but it's a rival that the United States has never confronted before because at the end of the day, when we look back at the Soviet threat, the Soviets were militarily strong, but technologically, economically, scientifically, they were nowhere near as strong as the Chinese are today. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if organizationally, the United States is well positioned to confront the Chinese the way you suggest they should. Again, as I pointed out, all the tools are there at the American disposal, but bureaucracy, infighting, we're a divided country, we have a very difficult time kind of agreeing on anything, will make it almost, in my view, impossible to confront a, a centralized government like the Chinese who are much more organized in that sense. Can you compare a little bit about the organization of the State Department and the US government to fight the Soviets, versus what we're seeing today with the Chinese. Yeah, and, and, and it's interesting you mention that because the column before the one you're mentioning now had to do with uh, the dysfunction of the State Department organization based on my observations coming back to the State Department. But, but, but here, here, here is the truth, and, and luckily this is being acknowledged more and more. The State Department, the United States State Department is organized for the 19th century you know, not even the 20th, let alone the 21st, desperately, desperately needs to be totally reorganized. The State Department and our diplomatic service runs under something called the Foreign Service Act of 1980. You think 1980, that's before the internet, and it's when issues like diversity 
Uh, you know, the, I, I tell people that the definition of diversity when I went in the State Department was a white male who did not come out of an Ivy League college. Uh, you know, how far we have gone since then, how far we still have to go, but this is being actively talked about, and there now is real discussion about a new Foreign Service Act. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very optimistic that the State Department will get reorganized with the 21st century in mind, that there will be a reallocation of resources to those embassies which really, really need it and that are on the front lines, you know, com confronting eyeball to eyeball this new global power competition. I mean, you know, th th the truth of the matter is how many diplomats do we need in Luxembourg and what difference can they make in, you know, in the overall shape of the world? Yes, it's a very nice place to be, and you can pick how many cheeses you want, you know, to buy. But, you know, what else is there? Whereas a place like Mozambique or, or let's take the DRC. You know, my indications are, I think, I think people need to realize that the DRC is going to become the, uh, the Gulf the Persian Gulf of the 21st century because of all the incredible mineral resources that are there, which are going to be fueling the technology of the 21st century. The bulk of which right now are controlled by Chinese companies. 40 to 50 percent of the output of cobalt in the eastern DRC is run by Chinese companies. I mean, Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. And so yeah. is there enough time? So it can, this is a sure. statistic that I'd love to put out. On November 30th of last year, Tainyao, which is the logistics arm of Alibaba, made an announcement with Ethiopian Airlines that they were going to build the new air bridge linking Guangzhou and Addis Ababa to deliver vaccines on the cold chain. 62 days later, the first plane landed in Addis. Mm -hmm. That's how fast these guys are moving. And yep. you're talking about an act that has to go through Congress and then spendings and appropriations committees and then restructuring a giant organization with a you know, 18,000 employees around the world, that's a big challenge by any standard. Is there enough yeah. time to compete against a rival who's moving very fast? Yeah, I, I, I absolutely do think so, because I think the solid foundation between what China is built on and what the United States is built on are totally, totally different. I would much rather be sitting from the American position for the longer term than the Chinese position. And I don't want to get into geography, you know, uh, neighbors, worldview, uh, culture. Uh, I'll just say one thing. I think it's an incredible strength of the United States that you can have a Hungarian immigrant, political refugee, rise up to be assistant secretary of state, or a Somali be sitting in the U.S. Congress. I want to see the day when a Somali is sitting in the Great Hall of the People or whatever they call their rubber stamp. You know, I, I, so, so serious. I mean, we used to say during the Soviet days that there were two, Af two types of young Africans who really liked the United States. Those who went to university training in America and those who went to university training at Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow. And, you know, we, we will see how this goes. But like I said... I am an eternal Afro-optimist, but I'm also an eternal Americo-optimist because I look around at our neighborhood, I look at our self-sufficiency in energy, I look at our tremendous resources in, in being able to feed ourselves, I look at Canada and Mexico and the two oceans as our neighbors, and, and I feel pretty darn secure, not about just about the present, but also the future. One of the questions that I that that I think about a lot at the moment is, I I'm I'm always very intrigued when um when Western diplomats talk about the rules based system um, and you know in, in your column as well you um you 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 know you 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 touch on that that China wants to, to change the rules of the global order um and you know it. it, it to, in, in the direction of, of a kind of a China-centric role. So I was wondering where you, particularly when you speak with, with, with African stakeholders, where you draw the line between, between American hegemony and some kind of objective rules-based system because the two it's very difficult to draw the line between them and to my mind you know the, the the one kind of led to the other you know we we have we have thanks to american 
hegemony, we have a certain kind of system, and that system is strongly, in, in, in some ways, a, a strongly a rights-based system. However, at the same time, we also have these kind of structural barriers that, that I think Africans really chafe against. Like, for example, the way that the World Bank president is always is always assigned by, by the American president, you know, whereas the, you know, so, so that, you know, those kind of structural exclusion, the, those forms of structural exclusion, is, is, is really bother lots of Africans. And, and China knows that, you know, China campaigns on that in Africa, on, on reforming that system. So where does that line lie between, between you know, attacking China for, for, you know, for wanting to reform the world system when many Africans feel that the world system should be reformed and should be reformed from a global south perspective, where does that that lie line lie between that and simply defending American hegemony? Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question, and of course, uh, you know, the United States is going to look at that from its own advantageous point of view. I mean, can you imagine that if the dollar was not the world's reserve currency? Could we get away with passing a $1.9 trillion, you know, COVID relief package without uh, abject fear of hyperinflation and, and losing our, our credit rating and, and things like that? So absolutely, the, the post-World War II global system was established chiefly by the United States, and it has greatly served the interests of the United States. Uh, my own view is that that system obviously is not going to go forward, uh, you know, unchanged as it is. There has to be a certain amount of modification to it. But at the same time, it's also obvious that the Chinese long-term strategy, and, you know, here they, they had definitely have an advantage in that uh, strategically they follow a, ca a calendar, whereas the United States follows a, a wristwatch. Uh, you know, their long-term objective, obviously, it's to, to replace that system, to make the yuan or uh, renminbi, uh, you know, the, the reserve currency, and to have the rules reflect the Chinese uh, view of the world as opposed to the Western view of the world. Uh, you know, talk about Foreign Corrupt Practices Act that our businesses have to follow. I mean, obviously, that would be uh, you know, thrown out the window. So I agree with you. Uh, the system has definitely been to the advantage of the United States, and uh, the Africans are absolutely correct that it is time to broaden that. I mean, you know, you can you can look around at all of these institutions, and it's somewhat uh, ridiculous. Uh, uh, even the the Security Council, where you have, uh, you know, France and Great Britain, you know, with with veto power, and there's absolutely nobody from from the global south so th this was 1945 uh now we're in 2021 and and these these systems absolutely have to be looked at support for this podcast comes from the africa china reporting project at the Witts university journalism department in johannesburg the ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at WitsChinaAfrica or visit africachinareporting.co.za. Let's turn our attention to the COVID-19 pandemic. You were called before Congress on a number of occasions to brief the House Foreign Affairs Committee and in, in some of these exchanges were actually quite lively. In fact, uh, you had one conversation with uh, Representative Tim Burchett, who is a Republican congressman from Tennessee. And there's a couple of takeaways from this conversation, and I'm really looking forward to getting your take on it. Number one is how well briefed and understanding are these committees and the representatives of affairs in Africa, specifically relating to the Chinese, and then obviously some uh, references to Jewish culture and Yiddish culture. So uh, let's take a listen to your lively exchange with Congressman Tim Burchett that occurred last July. Chinese, they're after us, and they're at everywhere they go, Belt and Road. I mean, you know, they. I don't believe they're ever going to take over Israel, but they built their deep port there, for goodness sakes. I mean, you know, it's just amazing that we get so diverted in this country. How is the U.S. Uh, messaging and pushing back on China and their influence campaign, specifically um, in the sub-Sahara Africa? Because in the last 20 years, we provided about $59 billion, billion with a B to um, 
to Sub-Saharan Africa uh, to combat infectious diseases and strengthen health systems. Well, you, you've hit one of my favorite subjects, and I'm sorry I don't have very much time to talk about China and Africa, because, but I, I'll make it very short. Uh, I think China gets chutzpah of the year for on, the, on their pretend response on COVID. It's like, uh, uh, in the African context, Hootspa, it's like- Chutzpah, that's, a, that's it, not an East Tennessee term, so. No, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's not, hung, it's not I'll Hungarian I'll explain it either. later. But, Ma'am. <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs> but, the, but the example, the African context is <laughs> the guy who shows up in the morning and sets the village on fire, then shows up in the afternoon with a bucket of water and wants to get credit for putting it out. Yeah. You know, and we, we have spent, as I said, and what we both said in our introductory remarks, I think $100 billion on African health systems in 20 years. And now all of a sudden, China wants to come in with some PPE equipment, so much of which doesn't work, and all of a sudden become the, the, yeah, the savior. Yeah, they want to go get their that, Like I said, chutzpah of the year. First of all, uh, congratulations for putting chutzpah on the congressional record. That is really a, quite an accomplishment. That was very, very funny and entertaining. But uh, let's talk about the, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic. You made those comments back in July when they were just delivering PPE. They delivered PPE to all... Uh, 54 countries. Now they are delivering tens of millions of vaccines. What is your assessment of the Chinese pandemic response in Africa now that you've had six, seven months of reflection since that time you made that testimony? The testimony was obviously done, um, you know, in its time. It reflected the, the situation which existed then. Since then, obviously, the Chinese deserve credit for uh, making their vaccines available in uh, you know significant uh, quantities to Africa, and, and, and here's a, here's a, a a big difference though. Again, the Chinese uh, internal system versus the U.S. internal system. Uh, an American leader who would divert vaccines to another part of the world before making sure that the United States itself was supplied would not have much of a political future. In China, the Chinese leader could care less. Uh, the Chinese can send their vaccines anywhere in the world. And you know that uh, village in Xinjiang or wherever might be at the end of the line uh, because it's not gonna make a hill of beans uh, at the next election because there is not another election ever uh, that's going to, you know, make a may make a, any kind of a threat to that politician's career. So the Chinese have much more freedom of action. Uh, we will see how good the Chinese variants, um, you know, of their vaccines are against these new types of COVID variants, the the South African type and especially the Brazilian type. You know, we we will just see. But absolutely, the Chinese deserve credit for for shipping the vaccine. I think, you know, to my mind, one of one of the more challenging aspects of of representing the the Trump administration in Africa was must have been dealing with the the shit old countries comment, um, which which you know kind of had a, a long life in, in Africa. I was wondering whether that made your job more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Yes, and, you know, uh, I came on. I came, took my job uh, relatively shortly after those comments were made, and I remember I, I knew this was going to happen. My very first trip back to the continent, and I stop off in London, and I have an interview with BBC, and I knew I was going to get that question, so I kind of thought about it because it's, you know, it literally is one of those "Have you stopped beating your wife?" questions. Uh, uh, and basically what I said was, I, 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 I didn't try to respond to the question. What I, what I said was basically, you know, uh, judge the United States by its actions on the ground in Africa and not by any rhetoric that anybody hears. And then I, you know, I gave some data points about, you know, how much we were giving in assistance and what have we done and, how, you know. So the, the interviewer was extremely unhappy that, uh, you know, that I wouldn't step into the minefield with that of either discrediting the president, which would have made my tenure kind of short, or, or you know, looking like a total idiot and trying to, you know, explain it away. So, yeah, it, 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 and that was, I, I have to tell you, I had a meeting uh, during my tenure with my Chinese counterpart at the time. I think he's left since then. 
<clears throat> to be an ambassador somewhere. And I, I congr- he was telling me that, uh, during our meeting that, you know, he's the one who planned the, um, the FOCAC uh, conference. And, and, I, and, and he had some other ideas. And I, I, I absolutely congratulated him. I said, you know, bravo for you. Those are exactly the kind of policies that need to be pursued in Africa. Because as, as the three of us know, in Africa, the, some of the most critical elements are one, showing up and two, establishing a, a personal relationship between interlocutors. And, you know, I give huge credit to the Chinese for, for not just recognizing that, but embracing that and always showing up, having high, the highest ranking members of the Chinese government reach out personally to African leaders, inviting them, whining them, dining them, giving them the red carpet. And the United States has been terrible in that, um, and I have said so even publicly uh, and, and before members of Congress, that, uh, you know, when the highest ranking American official uh, who shows up consistently in Africa as the assistant secretary, that's, that's actually insulting. Um, not that, you know, I, th- I think I know Africa pretty well for an American, but uh, symbolism matters. And that's why I was delighted. As a matter of fact, there's a recommendation, recommendation we made to the Biden transition folks uh, when we were talking with them was with the, uh, the Africa Union Summit coming up in February, how important uh, it would be for President Biden to actually, you know, send a personal message. And I was delighted to see that they did that. And my gosh, President actually, you know, goes to Africa if they end up inviting African leaders back to Washington, you know, next summer or the summer after that, that would be phenomenal because in Africa, that matters so much more than so much else. You you speak to the optics here and the relationship, which are so important, but yet, you know, at the announcement of Prosper Africa, not a single cabinet secretary went. In fact, there was, I think, Commerce Secretary was supposed to go and canceled at the last minute. And how insulting yeah. that is, that the big Africa initiative can't even get a mid-tier cabinet secretary. That was, that was yep. I mean, and you're just kind of like, <laughs> ugh. And then right now, so just this year alone, in the middle of the pandemic, not only has Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, been to Africa, but Yang Jiechi, his kind of presumed boss or the highest ranking foreign policy official in China has also been to Africa. And yet Anthony Blinken won't leave the borders of the United States. And I'm just wondering about the optics of all of this. And this is where I think the United States is, and you said here in your, in your column, they are kicking our tails nearly, nearly everywhere. Yep. And this is, the, this is the area and the space that I see the Chinese kicking our tails. Number one, the plane loads after plane loads after plane loads of vaccines that are showing up. And you're right that the American president cannot give one vaccine overseas or else he won't have a very long political career in the United States. But the optics of that look terrible Mm -hmm. on the wrong side of moral history. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then on the other hand, we see that, you know, the foreign ministers, other foreign ministers are showing up. The American Secretary of State won't leave the borders. We see, you know, over and over again, trade last year between China and Africa came in at 187 billion. That's just down 5 billion from the year before. They managed to keep up the trade levels, yet American trade continues to fall. My point here is not to berate the United States. My point here is to say, on the optics game, you're right, they're kicking our tails nearly everywhere. And I'm just wondering, do people in Washington get this? That, that we're losing, that they're getting our tails kicked? Yeah, uh, I, I have to tell you, um, especially, you know, the Africanists in the State Department obviously absolutely get it. I mean, absolutely. And uh, another... But how about the guy at the NSC in the White House? Do they get it? Who are advising the president directly? Well, this, this particular NSC, I, I, I don't know. Uh, the last NSC... Uh, you know, obviously they have to take their direction from the president. And my counterpart at the NSC and I, and I have said this <laughs> to Congress also, uh, our positions are that we can recommend policy and we can implement policy. Those two things. At the end of the day, when the decision comes to being made about policy, that that is far, far above our 
pay grade. But I, I was going to say that another group that really, really gets it in Washington are the congressional staffers who follow Africa on a day-by-day -day basis. I have to tell you that I was tremendously impressed uh, by their wealth of knowledge, uh, you know, their, their depth of knowledge about Africa, but also their level of frustration over what they saw as, uh, as an incomplete African policy exactly because of the optics, because of the lack of, of high-level attention. Uh, it, it, you know, so, some of these things are, for example, I'll, I'll just give you one example. It, you're obviously aware of the role that the United States uh, has played in the, um, in the negotiations between Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt on the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Yes, and remember uh, President Trump's comments on those negotiations, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so again, when, when the president makes a decision totally outside of any policymaking, you know, rationale system. And all of a sudden, it's the Secretary of the Treasury that is given the main role to, uh, to, to represent the United States in those discussions. Instead of the Secretary of State, uh, you have to say to yourself, okay, so what was the basis of that decision? Was it because when President Trump spoke with uh, President Sisi of Egypt, that it was Secretary Mnuchin who was sitting in the Oval Office? Is that why he was given that role? You know, thank goodness that it wasn't the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development that wasn't sitting in the White House at the time. So, 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 so the, yeah, these are some of the frustrations that I really, really hope and pray will not be repeated in the current administration because you have, okay, j just one example, you have somebody phenomenal like Linda Thomas-Greenfield now as the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, which to me indicates that for the first time ever, we, the United States, has somebody at the United Nations with the gravitas and with the sophisticated understanding of Africa and Africans and African culture to be able to advance U.S. policies in the United Nations beyond the substance. And you, you guys understand what I'm saying there, that, you know, there's the substance. And then, as you said, the optics and the, and the personality that goes with it. I think Linda's going to be terrific in the United Nations, especially terrific with Africans who, who constitute the single largest bloc that we have never, ever been able to truly effectively cultivate up to now. So it's interesting that you mentioned um, Linda Thomas Greenfield. I, I, I was because I was actually planning on, on asking you about her. Um, during her, her confirmation hearing, she faced a lot of criticism for a speech in which she uh, suggested that there is a, a possibility for for the U.S. and and China to cooperate on development uh, projects in Africa. Um, and you know, I, I think a lot of Africans would be pretty happy with that vision. You know, they like they, they as as Eric has mentioned, they they uh, many African leaders really don't want to be forced into a choice. They want as many partners as possible, and they actually want them to 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 cooperate to you know to to their different strengths. Um, so when you look. Forward um, to to you know say it's you know it's it's five or ten years from now and the U.S. Has, has turned the corner and is now a, a, a you know a prominent and, and 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 you know very helpful partner in Africa. What does that look like on the ground? If and and does that include formal cooperation with with Chinese entities on on particular projects? You know th that's going to be very very difficult because. We, we operate under such stringent rules uh, regarding development assistance. Uh, you know, for U.S. Agency for International Development, like over 90% of their funding is uh, tied up with congressional mandates. So, you know, I don't know how realistic that would be, but I'll, but I'll, I'll tell you one thing. You know, when the, uh, the, the Tigray... Uh, conflict erupted in November. One of the initial calls I made, uh, phone calls, was to my Chinese counterpart uh, because I felt like we had some very uh, major common interests in making sure that that situation was resolved as quickly as possible. And indeed, you know, based on our conversation, we, I, I'm not going to go into diplomatic, you know, 
conversations, but I- indeed there were some very significant, uh, you know, commonalities there. So on, on that side, I suspect it would be easier than on, on development project. And, and, you know, for example, look at, look at one major thing that's coming up, and that's the uh, Africa CDC and where that should be built. Uh, you know, if, if the Chinese end up building that, of course, the United States would have huge concerns. Construction's underway now, by the way. Well, but there's two different. There, there's the temporary facility and the permanent facility. And uh, the, the AU, as far as I know, has not made a decision on the on the final permanent facility. But you know, just <laughs> just imagine the Chi- the Chinese build that, and guess where all of the health data uh, that would come into that from the millions and millions of Africans. Uh, you know, data that would be collected, where that would end up. <laughs> so, you know, th- th- those types of things, we- we're going to have very serious uh, differences about. But I, but I think that there will be some, some areas potentially. But again, you know, Linda gave that speech, uh, I think, a number of years ago. And, and, and you really have to, to give the Trump administration credit for, as I said in my article, for really bringing the focus on the threat that uh, Chinese long-term imperialistic designs represent for not just the United States, but for the whole Western, you know, set of, uh, of, of rules of, of trade, of politics, and on and on and on. So let's wrap up our conversation on that note, because in your column, you issued a warning to the Biden administration to take this threat seriously. And uh, let, let kind of articulate what you want the new administration to do and to understand in terms of how to best confront China. Well, you know, we've, we've, we've raised some of these issues because, number one, I think that the State Department really does dramatically, drastically need to be uh, reorganized uh, based on the needs of the 21st century. Uh, number two, the Biden administration really needs to uh, re-equip our embassies, especially in Africa, to be able to deal with the global power competition as we were able to deal with the competition with the Soviets, to have the type of resources, not just financial, but uh, but staffing, to be able to you know, go, as I said, eyeball to eyeball with the Chinese so that not all the media placements are coming out of the Chinese embassy. You know, not all the radio spots are coming out of the Chinese embassy. Uh, Not all the trade delegations are coming out of the Chinese embassy. And then finally, what you so well articulated was the optics, the optics of having very high level U.S. officials, you know, from the secretary, the vice president would be terrific person to, you know, make visits to the continent and hopefully even the president himself so that the Africans recognize how truly valued they are, uh, you know, from the in the viewpoint of the United States. And then finally, my, my personal passion is university exchanges, because I really want the next generation of Africans to be educated through the U.S. types of universities not the ideological institutions that they would attend, you know, in China. The column is America's Global Power Competition with China from the Trenches. It was written by Tibor Naj, who is the former Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs under the Trump administration. He is now enjoying his, blissfully enjoying his second retirement from the State Department in Washington. Tibor, thank you so much for taking the time this morning to join us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. And and you guys have the best column I have ever read on the whole issue of, of China and Africa. So thanks so much for what you're doing and please keep it up. Kobus, after 35 years of being in journalism, I can tell you one thing abundantly clear that came out of that interview. It is a lot more fun to interview diplomats who are no longer in office than diplomats who are still in office because they're so direct. It was so great to hear some of the very blunt, direct comments from Ambassador Naj on on his reflections on the Chinese, on the American government, and, and, and the lack of attention that Africa policy has received over the years. What I can't get my head around is that in many ways he acknowledged the problems, and he said he said it up front, we're getting our butts kicked by the Chinese. 
I'm just not as confident as he is that there's enough time to catch up. The Chinese are moving fast. They are, again, unified because they're under an authoritarian dictator for life. That is a statement of fact. And they can bring a whole-of-government approach very quickly. The United States government is a fractured organization that, as he pointed out, is not even built for the 20th century. Not even the 19th century. I think he said the 18th century. I think he said the 19th. 19th. Okay, I don't want to be... uh, Let's not (laughs) embellish here. But more importantly, it's not optimized for the 21st century. And that's what I keep coming back to, which is this idea that the Americans have all the pieces that they need to mount a very effective response to the Chinese. They have a a really dynamic now development finance corporation. Prosper Africa, after a terrible start, has found its sea legs a little bit now. And I mean a terrible start because it was founded by former National Security Council advisor John Bolton, who mentioned China 14 times and Russia God knows how many times, and nobody took it seriously. But now it does seem like it's starting to get some vision There is the Young African Leadership Initiative, which is bringing students over. They have all these programs, but they can't bring it together. And then let's not avoid the fact that we are a terribly divided country where we hate each other. And that impedes the ability to mount effective policy. Because you do one thing and then you get hit in the Congress and saying you shouldn't do that or on Fox News. So the president has to react defensively. Ergo, not a single dose of vaccines is going to Africa or anywhere else. So I don't know how the Americans overcome this. I admire his optimism. I think it's great. But the reality today in 2021 is, as he put it in his column, the Americans are getting their butts handed to them. Well, you know, I... I, um it's it's yeah I, I agree with you that that it's really a difficult problem you know because because the Americans have so many tools at their disposal you know they they're so they're so powerful um, and the but I, it seems to me you know and, and and again this is very much an outsider view like kind of seen from very far away from from the center of the action but it it seems to me that there there's a bit of a a lack of of a vision of what winning in africa or winning is the wrong word of of what what a renewed partnership with Africa would look like, particularly one on the level of of you know the the what the Chinese are offering. Um, and and so so much of it, and this isn't only the U.S.'s problem. This is actually, I think, a Western problem because one sees a, a, a similar kind of thing in in Europe, um, where they, they 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 tend to kind of think a lot about. The, 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 there's a kind of a nostalgia there, right? About um, you know about our system. It's 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 so well designed. It's you know it, it it came out of the Second World War. It's focused on liberal human rights, all true. Like you know, but but it doesn't take into account that that the that Africa as, as a whole has generally been excluded from that system, right? Um, they you know they they. The, you know they they don't kind of get the benefits of of that of that kind of rules based system the way that that a country like Canada does for example, um, and so it's not only that the Chinese are pointing that out you know kind of and, and that they're, they're actually they're campaigning about against that that structural inequity but also that the Chinese whatever like whatever faults you you can you can you know lay at the door of the chinese and there are many is that the the chinese are very future oriented right like they when when they when they talk in, in africa they're always talking about the future they're talking about the growth development forward movement you know um and and the, and it's not only words it's also its acts you know it's it's the the thing of like rolling out a massive music streaming system you know in in africa for example so that seems to me lacking in in, in Western approaches. There's, 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 there's not really a, a strong kind of feeling of like this is what it's going to be like in you know 2035. Like this, you know, if you work with us now, you'll have these amazing stuff then. Like you're not really sure what that amazing stuff would be. I just don't get the sense that people in Brussels and Washington understand the threat. I I don't I just don't think they understand what they're up against. Well, maybe maybe if if we put it in a different way, like like what what threat are we looking at actually? You know, if, if it's not if it's not the threat of of simply them losing hegemony. But but that um, is the threat in many ways, and the threat here is that we're seeing a reorientation of the rules based order that they created. Now, here's here's a very important point here. 
if we look back at the past 400 years of economic history, it states clearly that the largest economy in the world gets to make the rules for everybody else. That was the case with the British. That was the case with the Americans in the post-war era. And now the Chinese are at about, what, 72, 73% of the American GDP. And so they are in sight now of eclipsing the United States economy in size. And as the largest economy in the world, they will be able to make the rules for everybody else. That is just the nature of economic history. There's no way that the number two and number three economy gets to set the rules for the number one economy. That hasn't happened. So I don't, maybe, maybe it will happen. But the, the, the idea that the, that the objection that, that Americans have to the Chinese changing the rules-based order in their favor seems kind of weird to me simply because that's what happens. Now, that, doesn't, that's, that is an end to the hegemony that the Americans have had for so long. And I think that's extraordinarily threatening, as it should be. But I don't know if they know what they need to do to deal with this, to tackle it. They're not making the investment in education, in infrastructure. We have a, a wealth gap that is enormous, and they're doing nothing about it. Tax cuts are the most popular policy that you can enact on the Republican side. On democracy, we're rolling back voter access. We have a divided society. I mean, that is not an ascendant country that can take on a power like China, in my view. And it's just, I mean, Europe is not an ascendant region either. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, I just don't know how do you take on a country like China that for all of its weirdness and faults, and many as you've pointed out, but being under an authoritarian dictator like Xi Jinping gives them an ability to move fast. You know what, where I think, and again, this this is very pie in the sky, but, you know, if if one is simply... If one is simply kind of thinking of of the, the the kind of being the largest economy in the world and therefore setting the rules of the world and making kind of everyone play according to your standards, then one might be able to do that. But then climate change is going to take that out in twenty years, right? Um, because you, be, you know, be, because that that kind of system is inherently archaic. Um, the 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 only way to move forward is to move beyond. The nation state, right? Kind of to find to, to to formulate some kind of some kind of inclusivity that really pulls in everyone. And China is to a certain extent doing that. You know, I think Belt and Road is, is an example of mm. that. However, China is no, I don't China is that. so solipsistic, right? They're so like insular, they're so focused on themselves. There's such complexes about, uh, you know, about you know historical complexes about being a you know thousand year old you know. Um, uh, civilization that I, I don't know that that China necessarily has that kind of that kind of thinking in order to really present a unified vision. The thing is, I don't know that the West as either because the West is so so much of of you know so much of it has to do with with you know, kind of with, with fantasies about how the West is superior to other places in so many different ways, many of which are, are like starkly racist and, and based on, on centuries of slavery. You know, so, so I don't know that neither of the two of, of either China or Western countries I find particularly powerful in that regard. But the thing is that that is the only game in town. You know, like is is to find some kind of like 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 beyond the state level kind of form of cooperation and vision vision creation. Um, you know that that's the only place to go to. But I don't know that either of the two is particularly kind of like made to do it. Probably not. But I just want to be very clear in my comments, just so that the record is is straight here, is that I actually don't believe that the Chinese want to become the next United States and to have a global hegemonic order, and they want to control that. I think yeah. what they want mm. is they want to make China great again for them, whatever that is. It's a very narrow vision here. This is about China. This is not about having the Chinese Navy operating a thousand bases around the world and sailing in all seven seas. And so it's a very different hegemony than what we've seen from the United States and Europe. And again, I'm not entirely sure we fully understand that in the US and Europe because so often we're trying to box in the Chinese into a paradigm that was from the last century. And that's, again, what I, what I keep coming back to with the Americans is that we as a country keep fighting the last war. We did that in Vietnam. 
We did that in Iraq. We did that in Afghanistan. I mean, we keep fighting the last war. And I think with China, we keep fighting the last war. And we don't fully understand what they're doing. And we're not committed to actually doing anything substantive to stop it. The only reason that Africa gets traction in Washington today is because of China. I don't believe that there would be a DFC and Prosper Africa without China. I don't believe that what Tibor said in terms of beefing up the embassies would be there without China. And so at the end of the day, Africans are going to look to this and say, you're only paying attention to us because of China. Because when Obama was in office, you ignored us. When Trump was in office, you ignored us. And Biden, maybe, he's not off to a great start as far as I'm concerned. He's made a couple phone calls, but that's it. Blinken has made a couple phone calls. But think about the phone calls that Blinken made. Blinken made a phone call to Cape Verde, right? This tiny little speck of a country off the coast of West Africa. Why? Because of China. Because it's in competition for strategic access to the ports because of China. So I'm not convinced that the Blinken team is going to be any more open-minded on really committing resources for Africa because of Africa x China. Yeah, no, I, I really, really agree. I think I think it's really, um, and I think I, I think Africans know that. You know, um, I think there's there's a lot of kind of cynical jokes about those those kind of about that kind of attention from the U.S. You know, in in Africa, um, and you know, the the thing is, is that the the I think I think Western Western stakeholders frequently you know the, the the way that they approach it is, is so frequently oh like africans like the chinese too much and we you know kind of an, and for deluded reasons and we need we need to kind of disabuse them of of, of this of this this kind of illusion whereas i think it, from the african side is frequently that africans don't really like anyone <laughs> you know because they've had they've had such bad no, they're, they're they're pursuing interests this is the this is the thing the infantilization I, I never say that word correctly, but the infantilization, here we go, of African agency is pathetic. It's as if they're making strategic interests based on their own national security concerns. And China's showing up. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. You know, so 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 the the they might not be particularly enthusiastic about China, but China is at least bringing independent African development into the conversation. Well, for some context, I really recommend everybody to take a listen to the interview that Kobus and I did with Ambassador Guang Wei Lin, who is China's first ambassador to the African Union. We did that last year. It presents a nice kind of juxtaposition against what Ambassador Naj was saying, and we're very proud that we have the opportunity to interview both Chinese and American ambassadors. Uh, ambassador Naj is, uh, you know, was a longtime subscriber to our newsletter, and we're very proud that he was reading it while he was in office. And that is, uh, we'd like for you to join our community of readers. If you're interested in these types of topics that Kobus and I are hashing out, trying to figure out, these are really difficult things to kind of figure out. You go to our website, sign up for ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. And just because you are our loyal podcast listeners all the way to the end of the show, we have a special 20% discount on a lifetime subscription. Just click the annual subscription box and enter the word podcast in the promo code and we'll give you 20% off forever. Uh, so we'd love for you to join us. We did today, for example, a big deep dive into Wang Yi's press conference looking at what he said about Africa, Latin America, and the Persian Gulf, kind of what it means in terms of the priorities. Those are the kinds of issues that we're talking about. We talked a lot about Ambassador Naj's comments all throughout the time that he was in office, so we hope that you'll join our growing community of readers around the world. Once again, ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. For Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. Or follow the guys on Twitter. Eric's at Iolanda, and you can find Kobas at Stadenesk. For more information about the China Africa Project and to sign up for our free weekly email news brief, go to chinaafricaproject.com. <laughs> <laughs>